And pay attention because this is a. I'm going to make the recap quick. Um, <clears throat> Krishna makes a, 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 a very strong statement towards the end of the 16th chapter. And he says that you need to consult sacred texts, Shastra from Shush, which means things which control. Shush means to control, so Shastra is things that control society. And the word Shastra is our word for sacred scripture. It's actually redundant scripture, which by definition is sacred. Um, that statement is still true today. We have a separation of church and state, which I think is probably a good thing if you want freedom of religion and you don't want a theocracy. But despite us having a separation of church and state, there's no way to run a group of people without having a list of rules that they all agree to follow. And that list of rules that you get everybody to agree to follow becomes a foundational document. And generally speaking, you can't just say, we arbitrarily pick these rules to follow, and they have absolutely no legitimacy outside of us having chosen them. Rather, when you're looking at the rights of man, which is the document that was used as the basis for the US Constitution, or you look at the US Constitution, or the Bill of Rights, or any document founding document of any civilization in the world. They make reference to God-given rights, inalienable rights, basic rights, fundamental rights, universal rights. The reason why they do that is because nobody says, we've decided that people have equal rights arbitrarily. People aren't equal. They shouldn't have equal rights, but we just randomly decided they should have equal rights. We, nobody says that. They say, we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equally and are endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights. So whether it's castle law, which was the idea that, you know, the king couldn't even come into your home without good reason. Everybody, every man's home was his castle, and you were allowed to defend it from intrusion, which, you know, gets, becomes stand-your-ground laws. Um, and becomes, which essentially extends castle law to being anywhere where you happen to be. So you have to back away. Normally you have to back away from a confrontation in many states. But like with Trayvon Martin in, in, in Florida, they had these stand your ground laws, which means castle law. The idea that you can defend your castle is not just in your home, but it's the area immediately surrounding you wherever you walk in the world. So if somebody approaches you, rather than backing down, you're allowed to stand your ground and even use lethal force to not back down. Do you guys follow this? That's how the guy got off. That's the argument he made. It was an illegitimate argument. He murdered Trayvon Martin. He was an idiot. But the way, I don't even remember his name. I remember the name of the person he killed. I remember the name of the guy who did the killing. But that was the way, that, that was the way he, he, was, he was armed. The person approached him. They got into a fight. He got freaked out, so he killed him. He instigated the fight. He approached the person in the first place and then invoked castle law. So he was aggressively attacking somebody and then invoking castle law. But that's the argument he made. When people make arguments in a courtroom, when people make arguments in, any, in front of any judiciary kind of panel or group, in any kind of serious discussion, they have to, they have to, to make reference to universal, fair, logical, reasonable laws. There's actually just no way to run a group of people without making some kind of a reference to what is fair, to what is reasonable. Hey, you chose where we had dinner yesterday. I get to choose today. There's, some, there's, there's actually a, like a legal argument in there <laughs> that fairness means that we both get to equally choose and because I, I gave you... Uh, um, first choice, then I get to make the second choice, and that's fair. And so, and so there's, there's inevitably, in any kind of civilization, in any kind of group of people, there has to be a reference to what is fair, equitable, reasonable, logical, and ultimately that becomes what's legal, and ultimately that becomes what's universal, and what's right, 
and what's ethical and what's morally uh, appropriate. So Krishna's argument that you have to consult Shastra is as true today as when he spoke it, although it might, you know, prima facie, at first glance, seem like an old archaic argument that we should have a theocracy, we should re refer to, 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 to sacred texts to make all our decisions. We still have sacred texts. We just call them the Constitution or the Bill of Rights. They're still equally as sacred. They're still considered, we still have the original parchments they were written on. They're protected. They're how people go to see them. People learn them in school. They recite them. And, 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 and it becomes the basis of, of the ethos of a whole group of people, of the legal system of a whole group of people. So Krishna makes an argument. He makes a statement, actually. He doesn't even make an argument. He just makes a statement. And that is you have to consult Scripture. But that's, we have to, you have to consult some fair and equitable and reasonable standard when trying to decide what you should and should not do. That's how he finishes the 16th chapter. Hey, hey, oi, oi, oi! Don't go in there. You have to wear dhoti or sorry. You cannot go in there otherwise. Leave him alone. He's doing puja. Wait for him to come. Hey, Pujari, I think he wants something. Um, so, Arjuna posits a really interesting question to start with the 17th chapter. He says, what if somebody worships Yajante? They worship and they're shradanvata, they're, 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 they're endowed with faith. They have faith and they worship, but they don't follow the Shastra. They don't follow the scripture. And he asked Krishna about the position of that person. Now, Krishna doesn't directly answer this question. Krishna starts off by pointing out how critical faith is. Well, Krishna mentioned that you have to follow some objective standard. And of course, if you're following that objective standard and you're, you're appealing to some higher source, then ostensibly you have faith in that source. Did you follow that? This guy's throwing me off, but it's, it's, it's okay. Hey, oi, oi. We have to stop now. It's disturbing my class. The noise you're making is disturbing me. Sorry, I tried to go as long as I could, but it's disturbing me for many minutes. Let the pujari do his seva. Okay, just silence, please. It's like trying to juggle or something. Like at a certain level, I just can't maintain my thought and especially if I'm trying to explain it to people. I'm not just being pedantic, I actually lose my train of thought repeatedly, and I just, you know, it's just like, I'm just not that sharp. Nah, they, got, they figured it out, that's fantastic. Okay, so, look at that, easy, right? Let's go outside, how about that? So they're having to have a conversation in a room that's having a class going on, you just go outside. Um, Krishna doesn't answer Arjuna's question directly. He'll get to it throughout the chapter, but he doesn't answer the question directly initially. Krishna initially says that shraddha, or faith, is critical to anything you do. Now, we could say that Krishna left faith out of discussion and was mentioning blindly following scripture, which is not a good thing to do, and then Arjuna adds a new element, which is that faith exists and worship exists in addition to the following the rules of scripture, which does, of course, recommend faith and worship. So you could, you, there's a kind of a few angles you could argue from. The scripture says you should have faith and do worship. Therefore, when you say follow the scripture, you're saying have faith and do worship. Did you follow that? Like if I say obey your father, and your father says be nice to your sister, then your father saying obey your father is equivalent to saying be nice to your sister because your father's going to say be nice to your sister. Did you guys follow that? Okay, that's like a transitive logic argument. Um, Another way of saying it is actually Krishna was just honing in on the scriptural thing 
and Arjuna adds a, a new ingredient to the discussion, namely faith, and Krishna's running with it. Yeah, that's a great point you, you, you brought up. Yes, faith is good. There's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing wrong with seeing it that way. That also works. So you... Just go out and make sure that he's not... Yeah, go. You go. Thank you. Um, the gifts that keeps on giving. <laughs> um... So you could, you could interpret it that Krishna is just, you know, arguing for following the scripture, and that includes faith, and that includes worship. Or you could argue that Krishna is saying follow the scripture, and Arjuna wants to talk about what about somebody who doesn't follow the scripture but has faith in worships, and that's actually a new thing that hasn't been covered yet. Because if following the scriptures includes having faith in worshiping, having faith in worshiping doesn't necessarily include following the scriptures. Just because it works one way, you follow, doesn't mean it necessarily works the other way. Like if a cup is full, then it's also half full. If a cup's half full, it doesn't mean it's completely full. You get that? If you have $100, you also have $5. If you have $5, you don't have $100. So Arjuna is asking, like, what about this little possibility? Now Krishna then just jumps on that and goes, yeah, faith is really important. And of course, if you're following something, ostensibly, you have faith in that thing. Otherwise, you wouldn't be following it. At the same time, you could be following, worshiping God without having faith in a particular scriptural tradition. That certainly is a reasonable possibility. And so Krishna begins to argue about different types of worship. And those types of worship he discusses are kind of specific to the, to the Hindu milieu. It's kind of specific talks about worshiping gods, like polytheism. You don't really see a whole lot of that. Although there are, I don't know, there are elements of polytheism at work in today's monotheistic traditions. Let me explain what I'm talking about. Um, when you start ascribing qualities like jealousy or anger or uh, yeah, let's go with those two. Jealousy, I'm a jealous God, and I shall have no other gods before me, right? And I'm going to smite them and smote them. So a jealous and angry God, which is the God of the Bible. Um, arguably, you're talking about a less than perfect, less than omnipotent, less than omnibenevolent deity. If you start ascribing material qualities to God, which I think many traditions do, including Hinduism. Then even if you posit that you are monotheist and you only believe in one God, really you almost more believe in like a superhero. And you would be more akin to somebody, let's say, from ancient Greece or ancient Rome, who, you know, worshiped Zeus, who theoretically could be killed by another God, that also suffered from lust, anger, and greed, was birthed by Kronos, and so on and so forth. So although you might say there's only one God, to really think of what a full-fledged conception of divinity looks like, omnipotent, omnipresent, omnibenevolent, omniscient, etc., etc., all the O's, all the big O's, right? Triple O God. Um, omniscient, omnibenevolent, and, and uh, omnipotent. Um, it, it's not necessary that, that everybody who believes in one God necessarily has worked out those elements. So you could theoretically believe in one God and have kind of an angry, trivial, you know, sadistic deity. Like, for instance, well, let's say you believe that you only have one lifetime. Certainly five billion people in the world believe that. Two-thirds of the world's population believes that. You only have one lifetime. In that lifetime, if you don't behave properly, you go to hell forever. Or, if you don't accept Jesus, you go to hell forever. Or, if you don't accept Muhammad, you go to hell forever. Or, just fill in the blank. We could do Moses and Abraham if you want to, although the Jews don't quite go this far. But let's say you did go that far. And anyway, the Jews only make up 13 million people, so it doesn't really matter anyway. There's still 5 billion, 2 billion, 
Muslims and three billion Christians. So there's your two-thirds of the world's population. If you don't accept Muhammad and embrace the Quran, if you don't accept Jesus and embrace the Bible, then you go to hell forever. You follow? I don't think it's humanly possible to make a cogent argument that an all-good, all-powerful God would let anybody go to hell forever for not accepting the right doctrine. We could just, we could just make a simple test. You blow it your whole life. Like, you're born into a Christian family, you reject the church for no good reason. It's not like your parents molested you or they did some terrible thing to you. Like, they were great parents, you just rejected the church because you were an idiot. Or you rejected the mosque because you were an idiot. You left, and you just went out and just did all manner of nonsense. Committed crimes, murder, rape, whatever. Fill in the blank, everything. Is it reasonable or just or fair that forever, for all time, you burn on a lake of fire and there's never any point at which you can redeem yourself? It is not. Here's why. An all-good God would want to always leave the door open for you. An all-powerful God could leave the door always open for you. Therefore, an all-good, all-powerful God would create a universe where the door was always open for us. To say that because of thought crimes... Because I went big. I went with, like, you're a, rap a rapist and a murderer. But to say, because what it really is, is you committed a thought crime. You didn't accept the right doctrine. And therefore, you are doomed for all time. A deity who would do that is either not all good or not all powerful. Therefore, that idea is a god with a lowercase g, more like a demigod, more like a polytheistic tradition than a true monotheistic tradition. Did you follow that argument? I never actually made this argument before, but it sounded good up here, so I'm just spitting it out. I actually think it works quite well. Um, so although Krishna's arguments are quite Hindu about worshiping gods, and it would make more sense to a Greek or a Roman or somebody from Norway, despite that, um, I still think his arguments hold water because he is attacking, uh, let's say, an impoverished notion of divinity. Demi-God is really an impoverished notion of divinity. And you could believe in one God. There's monolatry where there's many gods, but I only want to worship one. It's like the best one. And so there are, there are, you know, there are forms of sort of sub-monotheism, henotheism, monolatry, where there's many gods, but you pick one to worship. You only worship one, you pick one to worship. True polytheism, you worship many gods. Uh, henotheism, there's many gods, but you only worship one of them. Monolatry, there's many gods, but there's only one who's truly deserving of worship. Monotheism, there's only one god, and only one god to worship. But if you start believing in an impoverished notion of divinity, I think there is a fundamental sense in which you've segued into polytheism. You have a demi-urge, or God with a lowercase g. And I think if we look at most conceptions of divinity by most of the world's population who believes in eternal hell, you really start to cut away at the idea of God being all good and all powerful. Did you guys follow that argument? Now, Krishna makes some more general arguments, too. And one of his more general arguments is, if you believe in, in, in religious ritual that involves torturing yourself, harming yourself, then that sort of religious masochism is a, is a sign you're on the wrong road. And that's, that's, that's a much more, you could say, uh, easy to appreciate argument in today's world because there are certainly people I mean you know, here's, here's one for you how about uh, genital mutilation that certainly seems to be like a pretty dark practice well, normally when we think of genital mutilation like the term genital mutilation we generally think of um, you know, female genital mutilation so that women can't enjoy sex that's, that's, that's committed by Muslims in Africa or in the Middle East. 
some to very occasionally gets done you know elsewhere but those are the places where you can get away with that kind of stuff um, that's usually what you think of when you hear genital mutilation right I'm gonna go big and say circumcision is genital mutilation but somehow because the Jews and the Christians and the Muslims sort of universally like that and I don't know what the, what the numbers are but I'm assuming I'm assuming it's got to be two-thirds of the world's population, male population, is, is circumcised. So we give it a euphemistic name. We call it circumcision. It's no longer said to be genital mutilation. But I think if you objectively looked at it, like if you had an alien who came down to planet Earth and they saw what was going on, they would go, yeah, that's, that's, that's genital mutilation. It's the same thing. Do you guys follow that? So Krishna's argument would be, that's a problem. You start getting mutilation, it becomes a problem. Now, of course, I'm remembering the Sri Vaishnava tradition that brands you. That whole like, Nexium cult where they got the brand with the, with the, with the letters of the, of the person's name. Um, it's like so racy, but then I thought, yeah, actually, you know, like the whole group of our tradition in South India, tens and tens of millions of devotees, if not, if not 100 plus million, probably over 100 million Sri Vaishnavas rolling through South India today, in 2021, and they do the branding, where they get initiated and they get, they get tattooed, but with a brand of the chakra and the, uh, and the conch. So that, yeah, it's, it's not quite as bad as general mutilation. I mean, it's, like, you know, it's kind of like a, like a tough, tough tattoo. Probably like worse than some tattoos, some parts of your body. You only got a fair bit of, fair bit of cushioning there on your shoulders, on your deltoids. Like definitely better than like your ribs or something like that. And so, you know, maybe there's a, maybe there's some scope, like where does tapasya or austerity become mutilation? That'd be an interesting, you know, to try and figure out that line. Where is that line drawn? I'd say when you start cutting pieces off your body, you definitely have crossed the Rubicon and you are in the mutilation category. <laughs> so I think branding, even if we were to, you know, if we were to critique our own tradition, I think branding is still minor enough and minimal enough where it definitely is in that gray zone. I think once you start cutting piece, pieces of somebody off of them, which is what circumcision is, I think at that point you've clearly crossed the line and you are into straight up mutilation. Just my two cents on that. So Krishna makes some arguments which are pretty specific to Hinduism. He makes some arguments a little more generic, but I think all of them have value and they can all be generalized. Some of them are easy to generalize. Other ones take a little bit of work. I tried to take you through what that might look like. But you've got Krishna now and he's answered. If you're worshiping with faith, but you're doing certain things, that's a problem. You follow this? If you're worshiping with faith, but you're doing certain reprehensible actions that involve mutilation or involve harming others. Krishna says when you harm others, you torture me who exists in their, in their bodies. That's an interesting argument. You could also argue, well, we got to eat plants, and those are living beings, so Krishna's also in the plants. And so are you torturing Krishna when you eat plants? And if not, what are you going to eat? You go big with that. You can say, I'm only going to eat fruits, which fall off the tree naturally. There might be a certain circumstance in which you could make that work. There might be some fruits and vegetables you could eat that you know have, they, they have absolutely no harm to the plant. You're not killing any living beings. You're only eating the fruits. Um, and so when you say that you know if you're torturing others, if you're hurting others, certainly if you're hurting other human beings, that's a problem. We'd also argue if you hurt animals unnecessarily, that's a problem or human beings unnecessarily. We'd have some caveats there. If you were defending yourself, you could hurt a person, and that wouldn't be considered to be torturing God in their body. If you were defending yourself against an animal, that could also be okay. Then you get down to plants, and we would probably make an argument that was, you know, everybody has to live on something. We want to eat as low on the food chain as possible as low on the karmic food chain as possible. We want to have the smallest karmic footprint, and the smallest karmic footprint is plants with no central nervous system, no CN neuron fibers, who don't feel pain the same way we do, and there you go. If you want to take it further and not eat, eat, even kill a plant, 
not rip a carrot mercilessly out of the ground, right? Okay. Like, I'm not hating on you for that. Like, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not anti that. No problem. Somebody said, I don't want to do that. I'm like, more power to you. That's cool. I respect that. Let's see how long you can keep it up for. You know? Like, you know, tell me, like, let's, let's wait a couple of years. Let's see if you can actually swing it before you start, you know, uh, getting up on your soapbox and thinking you're, you're as, as cool as they come. But I don't think it's wrong to take it that far. We don't take it that far. We take it to the plant realm. And so there might be some scale here, you know? There might be some scale here. Very often you'll meet Hindus, you'll be like, do you eat meat? And they're like, yeah, I'm taking the meat. And you'll be like, what do you eat? And he's like, you know, some chicken. That's like, that's pretty common. Fish. Eggs is like, that's like, then they'll be like, yeah, I'm vegetarian. They'll say, but sometimes I take eggs. All right. And you say, are you eating meat? They'll be, yeah, I eat fish sometimes. Then you're eating meat? Yeah, I eat fish and chicken. Then it's fish and chicken and mutton, which is goat meat. And then the last one is fish and chicken and mutton and beef. And like you almost never meet a Hindu where they say they eat beef. So even them, with their killing other living beings for food, they usually draw a line somewhere. Even the Jews, they have their milkum and fleishum. A strict Orthodox Jew who keeps kosher has to have two separate kitchens where they cook. And they cannot cook meat and milk in the same kitchen, and they cannot eat meat and milk in the same meal. It's unkosher. Because there's some rabbinic commentary that says you can't boil a baby in its mother's milk. Because they recognize that the cow gives milk to human society, and therefore to eat the cow is offensive. Of course, we got a problem in that the milk industry is the meat industry. And um, all hamburger meat in fast food restaurants in North America is spent dairy cattle. Dairy cattle is around the age of five. They, their milk production goes down. They've been impregnated a few times. Their milk production goes down, and then they kill them. And the meat is an inferior quality because it's an older animal. hasn't been raised just for slaughter. And so then they, that meat becomes hamburger, and that hamburger is sold to fast food restaurants. And every fast food hamburger in the U.S. is a spent dairy cow. In fact, dairies get about 20% of their profits from the sale of spent dairy cattle. If you add into that the, the boy cows that are born, the, the bulls that are born, that are then sold off directly to the meat industry, it becomes an even larger percentage of their, of, their, of their profits. Do you guys follow this? So the meat industry and the milk industry are, they're just completely interlinked in, uh, in, our, you know, in our society. You don't have one without the other. And the only way to circumvent that really is to just have your own cows. And so if you want to drink cow milk and you don't want to be involved in the needless slaughter of cows, you either have to buy your milk from an animal sanctuary or you have to yourself have an animal sanctuary. So that's the only way to do it. So, you know, these... Uh, I think the points Christians are introducing... You know that they, if if you if you can if you want to extrapolate on them a little bit, I mean I think there's value just in reading it straight. Krishna outlines demigods and rakshasas and and ghosts and kind of like you know people who worship dark things and and he talks about torturing and so I think you can just kind of take it straight and there's some value, but it's it's quite Hindu and it's quite old world, but if you extrapolate a little bit. Krishna stuff is compelling and thought provoking. <clears throat> and it's, uh, yeah, it, it actually is like a, um, perennial and also current. You know, of course, things are perennial, then they're current. Because they're true for all time, so they're true for now. And so Krishna makes some interesting arguments. But he still hasn't hit this, you know, what's the position of somebody who worships but doesn't and has faith? but doesn't follow the scriptures. You guys with me so far? All right, that's our recap, which took half the class. Um, now, there is a little thing. 
one who undergoes austerities and penances not recommended in the scriptures, performing that of pride and egotism, impelled by lust and attachment. So he's already started to introduce that low people don't follow the scriptures. And I guess to make an argument for this, this is text 6, we're starting on text 7, but just to make an argument for this, um... What if I said to Krishna, I don't undergo any austerities impelled by lust or egotism. I don't undergo austerities that hurt other living beings, but I don't follow the scriptures. Did you follow that? You didn't follow that? Krishna says, if you undergo austerities not recommended in the scriptures, of course this is interesting, it's, it's like not ordained in the scriptures, that would mean you're working against the scriptures. So there's one. It doesn't mean you have to necessarily get them from the scriptures, but if you go against the scriptures, then it's a problem. So now you're left with this argument. I say to Krishna, hey Krishna, what I'm doing isn't ordained in the scriptures. But it's not impelled by lust or pride or attachment. It's not foolish. It's not torturing anybody. What's my position? Do you follow that potential argument? Krishna can then respond and say, if it didn't have any of those features, it wouldn't be, it, it would be ordained in the scriptures, and you wouldn't have a problem. Our scriptures are well put together enough that we don't have any loopholes. Like, for instance, if you look at, let's say, U.S. law, it's pretty hard to get out from U.S. law and do something which isn't covered by U.S. law. When you take the Constitution and the federal law and you take state laws and city ordinances, you put them all together, you got a pretty comprehensive look. There was, this, there, there, there was a group of people, they, they took 10 years. They put together a system of laws for anybody who wants to use them, and most of the states have adopted it. It was like a bunch of lawyers who just sat down and figured out what a good template for a legal system looks like. And most states follow that legal system. And it's like it's all categorized, and it's really comprehensive. And every once in a while you come up with something that isn't covered by... Law. And you know what happens? It goes to the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court doesn't just hear the big cases. They also hear these weird little cases that sometimes come up. That are, did you ever take a constitutional law course in college? Okay. So it's a, it's a weird thing that the Supreme Court actually hears a number of cases which are not like life and death and Roe v. Wade type huge stuff but they're just stuff that doesn't fit into any, anything that's been done yet, and they have to set a precedent for it. Then it's done, and then it goes back to, goes back to life goes back to normal. But it's very occasional. It's tough. It's tough to commit a crime or do something that isn't covered by a law. Every once in a while, bath salts came out. You guys know what bath salts are? Bath salts came out. They were all the rage in like 2010 or something like that. The, early, the late aughts. Um, uh, I don't even actually know what they are, but they're like a synthetic um, stimulant, designer drug, it's extremely cheap, that also has hallucinogenic side effects and also is famous for giving people really, really dark visions and filling them with really, really dark thoughts. Like, like, you know, like, like one, of the, one of the side effects of this drug is suicidal ideation. Like, it's like one of the main, it's not like a side effect, it's like one of the main effects of this particular drug. And you take it and the come down from it is just hellacious. I never took them. Um, but anyway, and I, there's an actual technical name. They're called bath salts. They kind of resemble bath salts. Um, kind of crystalline in structure. Some, some, a little bit like methamphetamine. A little bit like crystal, a little bit like MDMA. Um, but bath salts were not illegal because it was a new designer drug and so it just wasn't covered. So there was a time, and this happens occasionally, where a new drug would come out, a designer drug would come out, and it's not covered, so you can just sell it and no one can get on your case about it. And then just very, very quickly, you know, I don't know if it's the Fed or if it's the DEA or if it's the state, but people start passing laws against it and figuring it out. And then sometimes they pass blanket laws against any number of drugs in that family. So when they come up with new designer drugs that don't have quite the same chemical structure, they're broadly covered under, under legislation. But that's a new thing. The drugs came out and they hadn't found them yet. 
I don't know how I got into that. Yeah, loopholes. Anyway, it's tough to find a loophole. Occasionally it does happen, but it's tough to find a loophole. Generally speaking, if you're committing crimes, it's covered. So somebody could ask this question, and you know, there's two answers. One is, well, let's take a look at it and see if it follows some universal principles and how good it is. Or B, we can argue, yeah, our scriptures covered everything. And so if it's not, if it's, if it's like anti our scriptures, then it's probably a bad thing. And that would be a way of us not just saying, blindly follow our scriptures. It's a rather way of saying, our scriptures are really well thought out and quite reasonable and they cover all bases. You guys following what I'm doing here? Yeah. Okay. So, then Krishna says, even the food each person prefers is of three kinds, according to the three modes of material nature. The same is true of sacrifice, austerities, and charity. Now hear of the distinctions between them. So, Krishna's now back on the guna thing. I, I didn't get into that. Arjuna's question was technically what gunas is in. I remembered it. I just didn't want to make my, my recap too difficult. But essentially, Arjuna has asked Krishna. Krishna's defined the whole world in terms of the gunas, in terms of this basic theory of, you know, something can be uplifting, it can be um, status quo, or it can be degrading. Something can be moving you towards light, keeping you where you are or dragging you down. Something can be healthy or passionate or ignorant. Something can bring clarity to your life, or something can obfuscate your life, and something can make things very dark. And there's, there's essentially three kind of a tripartite system for categorizing all of reality. And now what's happening in the 17th chapter is that lens is being used to look at the world of religion. So what does religion consist of? Well, it consists of charity, personal austerity. It's like what you do and what you don't do. What you give up and what you do. And so now Krishna's going to look at charity. He's going to look at austerity. He's going to look at food, which is very, very important to some religious communities, including ours, what you eat. Also, the Jews are quite strict about this. We take, you know, the whole food thing is very, 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 very important to us. And so, Krishna's going to begin to look at the kind of general features of religious practice and locate them within the gunas, springboarding off of Arjuna's question. He circumvents the question about faith versus scripture. And can you have faith without following the scriptures? To some extent. But he's already begun to make mention of not following the scriptures as being a dark thing. He's going to continue to do that throughout this chapter. And he's really going to end up answering the question by the time we get done. But he goes about it a little circuitously. He goes about it a little... Um, in a meandering way. And so what's happened now is the conversation's been exploded and now Krishna's going to begin to describe spirituality, what will be called uh, really orthopraxis, proper practice in a religion. Orthodoxy, orthopraxis. So orthodoxy is correct belief. Orthopraxy is correct practice. And so Krishna's now going to start to go through it. And he's going to start to give us a bit of a tutorial on how he views the world of religion. The ex external, expressed, acted out world of religion where people are actually engaging in ritual. So he's dealt a little bit with worship and talked about some impoverished notions of divinity. And he's, he's you know, kind of hit us with that a little bit. He's talked a little bit about general ideas about torturing yourself or others, causing pain. And now he's going to get into a larger, larger discussion on the topic. You guys with me? Okay, here we go. Food dear to those in the goodness increases the duration of life, purifies one's existence, 
and give strength, health, happiness, satisfaction. Such foods are juicy, fatty, wholesome, and pleasing to the heart. Okay? It's pretty straightforward. Fatty is snigda. And so certainly fat is an absolute requirement for health. Many, many physiological processes depend on fats. If you remove fat from your diet, it's, it's, it's extremely problematic. Fats are also required for good brain function and for any number of uh, metabolizing processes and also just, you know, in, for, for any number of physiological processes. Also, they're a great source of energy. So, you know, that would be the only one I think that might be a little questionable. But, you know, since um, Udo Erasmus wrote his book, Fats That Heal, Fats That Kill, which became all the rage, and people started freaking out about how fats could be good for you, nobody's hating on fats anymore. There was a time in the 80s where fats were a demon. People had a high-carb, low-fat, low-protein diet, but they figured out that was really stupid because, you know, we got better microscopes and we started to be able to look on a cellular level and realize what was involved in human digestion and what was involved in, you know, uh, the production of muscles. We're out of, like, the dark ages. The 80s, 70s, 80s were dark ages. Like Arnold Schwarzenegger used to take uh, human growth hormone pulled from cadavers which has a whole host of problems associated with it because they hadn't come up with recombinant human growth hormone and remove that extra molecule. There's going to be 164 molecules or something like that. You have to remove one of them, and then it becomes healthy for you. Otherwise, you end up getting this like really terrible disease. And, uh, and so, yeah, you know, there's just all sorts of weird stuff which happened back in the day. And back in the day means in the 70s and 80s even, even in the 90s, before we actually figured out what made people healthy. Anyway, um, foods that are too bitter, too sour, salty, hot, pungent, dry, burning, are dear to those in mode of passion. Such foods cause distress, misery, and disease. That one's pretty easy to get to. You know, pretty easy to understand. You know, people who just like to eat like massive amounts of chili and end up giving themselves an ulcer. Or, you know, when I was a kid growing up, people would like, they, they sold pickles a large pickle in like, in like a bag. It would be like a like, um, um, Ziploc in a bag, you know? Like, I don't know if you guys had this. So like a bunch of juice and a pickle and people would, you know, buy a pickle for like breakfast. Gnaw on the pickle all day. <laughs> corn nuts were also a real big item in my school growing up. People buy corn nuts and pickles. And like that was like half our school ate corn nuts and pickles for breakfast. Um, and so I think those things would qualify as excessively dry. Corn nuts are like about like it's just like the like the amount of dryness is just like they're like the driest thing in the cosmos. It's like eating a desert, you know. And you practically you need the pickle just to get you a little bit of juice, you know, a little bit of vinegar, like to like moisten your mouth from chewing all that sand. And then pickles are, you know, maybe the most astringent thing you can possibly imagine. They're literally coated in vinegar and salt water. It's just like, it's like drinking ocean water or something like that. It's like the worst thing for you. Um, weirdly, I was a fan of relish growing up. And I haven't eaten relish in like 30 years. Trader Joe's just got an organic relish without onions and garlic. So I've been eating relish lately. It's like, I'm just like, where have you been all my life, you know? Like, relish is, like, super cool. Um, I'll, we'll see how long it lasts, but it's the same basic thing. Relish is cucumbers diced up, usually with some peppers involved, and it's got that little bit of astringence, a little bit of sweet mixed in. It's actually, most cultures, really, the most popular food in most cultures is really this combination. It's like teriyaki sauce, right? What is it? It's like, it's like chutney, teriyaki sauce. Relish. It's like, what is it? It's a little bit of sweet, a little bit of salt, and a little bit of sour mixed together. And that becomes this, you know, this like basic sauce of a tradition. Even, you know, even like a, a good marinara, it's got, you know, it's got that little bit of tart. It's got that little bit of sweet. It's got that little bit of salt in it. Like a good marinara, you got to throw a little salt in there. You got to throw a little sugar in there too. It's just straight... Uh, tomatoes doesn't work. 
need that. And the only tomatoes themselves, they, they, they have kind of a little tart and they have a little bit of sweet in them anyway. And I always throw a little bit of, of paste in there just to get that little bit of extra, that little bit of extra tartness, right? But tomatoes are a fruit, actually. Um, which gives rise to a whole other thing, salsa, like the greatest thing ever invented in the history of the world. Salsa is the same kind of thing. You got a little lemon in there. There's your astringent. You got a little sweet in there, right? You got a little salt in there. A little chili in there. A little heat in there, too. They throw a little heat in there as well. What to speak of chutneys and pickles, which are just the original, the original teriyaki sauce of the old world of India. Um, salsa, you know, people finally figured out that tomatoes were a fruit. So then they started making mango salsa which is just like, again, where have you been all my life? And then they start making pineapples. Like, you ever have pineapple salsa? It's out of this world. It's like ridiculous. It's so good. Good pineapple salsa, tomato salsa, mango salsa. And you just realize, wow, it's really the sweet with the, with the salty, with the astringent. But when it goes too much, when you cross that road into corn nuts, when you cross that road into pickles, straight pickles for breakfast, you're on your way to an ulcer, and you are firmly in the mode of passion. Here it is. Something, something people might not realize is when you eat extremely hot food, you don't have to eat as much. And so extremely hot food is, 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 is very typical in the cuisines of poor groups of people. And so when you, know, when you go to places in India, this is my main experience, you know. Like, like I mean, I've, I've been to other places, but my main experience with cuisine is is in India. I mean, I've been to Soweto in South Africa. I've been to other really. I've been to poor places in South America, and the favelas and uh, uh, the favelas in, uh, in, in in Brazil as well. I've been to some real poor places, you know, places like Paraguay, Uruguay, like really poor countries, and poor parts of other countries as well. But. Uh, um, in India, when you go to the places which are very, very agrarian, very, you know, village culture, the heat level in the food goes way up. <clears throat> and you can satisfy yourself with like a much smaller quantity of food because somehow the chili kills your appetite. You can only eat so much of it. So I, I, I found just, just anecdotal, not even anecdotal, but my own experience in the world, I found that when you have a, a real poor agrarian, you know, where, where people actually don't have that much food on the table, then they end up going, they, they go high on the heat because it fills your belly. So anyway, that's mode of passion, but that's just a little extra on there. Food prepared more than three hours before being eaten. Food is tasteless, decomposed, putrid and food consisting of remnants and untouchable things is dear to those in the mode of darkness. Well, that sounds gross. Generally speaking, we don't eat leftovers. There's a letter from Prabhupada to his disciples in 1968, and he's, he's like, there should be no need for leftovers. You cook the appropriate amount, people eat, you finish everything, and there should be no leftovers. If you look at most old world cultures, and this is old world cultures across the board, it's true in Mexico as well, it's true everywhere, and I have a lot of experience in India, but it's actually true everywhere. If you look at old world cultures, nobody ever leaves anything on their plate. Very common in the West that you leave food on your plate. If I'm done eating and I'm not hungry, then I leave the food on my plate. Maybe for later, maybe I just check it out, kind of depends on how I feel. I think I might want to eat it later, I keep it. If I don't want to eat it later, I chuck it out. In most old world cultures, you eat everything on your plate, you don't leave anything. If you didn't grow up like that in this country, if you go back to the old country and you look at your grandparents, they follow this rule. You got to be careful how much you put on your plate. Just put a little bit on your plate each time, you know? because you don't know if you're going to want to eat it all or not. And then you can ask, oh, that's for seconds or thirds. Anyways, the problem said, you know, you just cook the right amount and you eat everything and you don't have any leftovers. He said, but if you want to have these leftovers, you can have your own leftover fridge, but it cannot go back in the regular fridge where you keep 
the food that's going to be offered to Krishna. You have to have a special fridge for those leftovers. Crazy, right? And so, most culture, at least Indian culture, they're not into this eating leftovers, old food. But then there's usually a caveat. <laughs> they usually have some kind of caveat, like, for instance, dosas and utapam, they involve making a rice and bean, rice and dal gruel that's then allowed to sit overnight and ferment, and then you cook it the next day, and it's absolutely epic. So most cultures have some way that they allow for certain things to be fermented, and it's considered to be a good thing, and then they usually criticize the things from other cultures. Somehow lasagna is better the next day. You know, you make a nice lasagna, nice vegan lasagna, you make it, and you heat it up the next day, and it's like, it's even better than the first day. It's like made to make and then cool and then reheat. It can even be the same day, but it needs to go through that process to, so it congeals, really is what happens. It becomes more structurally sound and the flavors intermingle. Um, but as a general rule, you know, our tradition does not eat leftovers. I don't think it's a big deal. I don't think you guys should go get a tattoo on your face or anything like that. But if you hang with strict Hare Krishna people, especially in India, we don't eat leftovers. We cook, we eat, we finish what's on our plate, we don't leave food on our plate. Sometimes you'll see devotees like they'll, they'll be wiping their plate. Have you ever seen that? Wiping their plate. They're not leaving anything on their plate. It's a respect thing. You're respecting the prasad that's been offered to you, and you're also showing your gratitude by not wasting a morsel. Sometimes you take a little bit off your plate and you throw it away, and that's saving something for lesser living entities. And so you're showing you're not a miser, and you're sharing your food with the, you know, the insects and what have you that live in the world. One time Prabhupada saw an insect in his room, and his disciple came in, and Prabhupada said, I've been studying that insect. He looks like he's tired. Take him outside and put him on a leaf so he can get some nourishment. Prabhupada has his, his servant go and pick up an insect, take him outside, put him on a leaf so he can eat. <laughs> And so, uh, anyway, this is just, you know, some of the stuff is cultural. I think Krishna's arguments here are uh, less cultural, but I'm just kind of filling in the blanks a little bit for you guys. So, in general, we don't like to eat leftovers. You cook what you're going to eat. We especially never reheat rice, or kitchari for that matter. You cook it once, you eat it. If you reheat it, like people are like, I'm going on a kitchari cleanse. And they like make a big pot of kitchari and eat it over three days. You just defe defeated your entire kitchari cleanse by reheating the food you're eating because by reheating it, it's considered to make it poisonous. That's the rule. So it's like this weird mix of Western and Eastern virtues where people want to do a kitchari cleanse, but then they make a pot of kitchari and heat it up over and over and over again over a period of days, thereby poisoning themselves ayurvedically do you guys follow this anyway there's food we dealt with food of sacrifices so now he's going to deal with yagna sacrifices means ritual fancy performances of vedic rites like for instance the fire sacrifice gives you an idea there's other ones but that's you know, that's what we're talking about the sacrifice performed in accordance with the directions of scripture. There's that coming up again. As a matter of duty, by those who desire no reward is in the nature of goodness. <coughs> but the sacrifice performed for some material benefits or for the sake of pride is in the mode of passion. So if you do a religious performance and it's according to the scriptures and you're not looking for anything, it's a matter of duty, that's goodness. If you do the same exact ritual, but it's out of pride to get a name for yourself, or because you're hoping, or because you're hoping, you're cool, you're cool, do your thing, or because you're hoping to get something back, you just ruined it, and it's the mother passion. A lot of times, goodness and passion are opposite. No reward, reward. Matter of duty, matter of pride then usually the mode of ignorance is kind of diametrically opposed to the worst elements of the mode of goodness. So, you know, it's almost like uh, goodness is, is, you know, these three items, 
then passion is two of those items is lacking. And then of those three items, one was most important. And then ignorance is that one that was, that was most important is lacking. And it's just running in completely the wrong direction to degrade yourself. This is Thomas. Any sacrifice performed without regard for the direction of the scripture, that's the big one. Without distribution of prasadam, spiritual food, without the chanting of Vedic hymns and remuneration of the priests, and without faith, is considered to be in the mode of ignorance. There, Krishna links up faith and the scriptures together as one thing, and when you don't have either one, you're in the mode of darkness. Did you follow that? Austerity of the body consists in worship of the Supreme Lord, the Brahmins, the spiritual master, and superiors like the father and mother, and in cleanliness, simplicity, celibacy, and nonviolence. So that's austerity of the body. Now, worshiping God and worshiping your parents are obviously on two different levels. <laughs> we could just, you know, we could say that veneration is of different degrees. And so venerating your elders, venerating your parents is different than venerating God, obviously. But appreciating your upline, cultivating gratitude to the people who've walked before you, cultivating gratitude to the people who made you, that is in the mode of goodness. And simplicity, celibacy, nonviolence, and cleanliness. Now, that's all in the mode of goodness. Austerity of speech. So you see this? It's no longer goodness. I'm sorry. It's no longer goodness past your ignorance. It's austerity of the body, mind, and words. So Krishna, he breaks it up here. See how he jumped? He's not following that three-part model. He's another three-part model. Body, mind, and words. Austerity of speech consists in speaking words that are truthful, pleasing, beneficial, and not agitating to others and also in regularly reciting Vedic literature. All right, that's speech. Speech is a, a, a neutral point or a, a midpoint between thought and deed is your speech. And so controlling your speech helps to control your thoughts. Controlling your speech helps to control your deeds. You start by controlling your deeds and you work to your thoughts through speech. You start by controlling your thoughts and then work to your deeds through speech again. But speech is powerful. That's why group therapy is powerful. That's why talk therapy is powerful. That's why journaling is powerful. So I talking to somebody is powerful. So I talking to somebody can also be terrible. You follow? It can also be really degrading. I remember once I was a monk. I was in Toronto. We were out of the program. Asking, I came. They, they took. Me, they brought me to Toronto to ask for a big donation from this devotee who actually owned a boxing studio. Um, so we went, we went, we traveled several hours outside of, of, of uh, Toronto. And then, uh, um, and then we came back. And it was myself and some leaders. But then there was also some, some kids that were with us, some Guru Cool boys. You know, they were probably five, six years my junior. So I was in my early 20s. They were probably in their, like, their late teens. They came with us. Maybe they do the Kirtan or something like that. Or just tag along because we, we, we buddied up when I went to Toronto. So as we were driving home, from, from the uh, program, we had to drive through downtown Toronto. And as we drove through downtown Toronto, we drove through the red light district. Or I guess it was the red light district. There was a bunch of prostitutes on the other side of the street, like lining up the street. It was the middle of winter time. It was the middle of summer, actually. It wasn't winter time. And so they were scantily dressed. I was going to say it was the middle of winter, the dead of winter, and they were still scantily dra dra dressed, but it's actually not true. It was the middle of summertime, and they were scantily dressed, you know, doing their street walker thing. So I was just like, let's get my head down, chanting my japa. But yeah, you know, my peripheral vision, I definitely noted them. I also remember seeing a viper for the first time in my life. I'd never seen a viper before. Earlier that day, as we were driving out to the place, that just randomly occurred to me for the first time in, you know, whatever it is, 27 years. Um, and so we drove back to the temple. And then the Guru Cool boys, who I was with, you know, snot those brats that they were, they started talking about the prostitutes that we'd seen walking on the street and making jokes about it. And I kind of like went along with the jokes for about five seconds. And I was like, yeah, I'm out of here. Like, I don't want to hang out while they talk about prostitutes on, on the street because I'm a priest and I'm going to go home and go to Mangalarti tomorrow and this is kind of ridiculous. You guys follow this? 
I found out years later that they actually went back and like, like you know, paid for sex. And that was kind of like their thing. And I think they were probably like trying to see if I was like game. They were sort of opening the door to have that discussion with me to see if I would, I would bite or I would nibble on that. You follow? That's an example of talking being a precursor to deeds. I, of course, by the grace of Krishna, was a good brahmacharya. And so I was like, why are these low-class gurukul kids talking about this? I'm going to go back to my room and chant some japa and read and go to sleep. <laughs> but now, like I said, I never thought they would actually do something so foul. And I was surprised when I heard later, years later, what they were up to when their marriages collapsed due to their sex addiction. Um, so yeah, it's, a, it's an often overlooked phenomenon that speech connects thought and deed. And it works either way. If you're good at controlling your actions, work on your speech next, it gets to your mind eventually. If you're good at working on your mind and you want to control your, your actions, then work on that. And cognitive behavioral therapy really is both, and the cognitive therapy is done through the medium of speech. You have talk therapy and you reframe the way you view the world. And so speech is intrinsically linked to cognitive behavioral theory because uh, therapy because it's the methodology by which you address um, mistaken belief and reframe some for somebody as you do it through speech. Did you follow that? I never thought of that either, but that's pretty cool too. And satisfaction, simplicity, gravity, self-control, and purification of one's existence are the austerities of the mind. And so just because you control your body and just because you control your words, we also have to learn how to control our minds and reign in our minds and cultivate gravity, cultivate satisfaction, cultivate happiness, learn the art of being happy in whatever circumstance we find ourselves in. We should be able to be happy in any circumstance we find ourselves in. Prabhupada said, my devotees, a devotee is able to sit down anywhere and chant Hare Krishna and feel ecstatic. We should be able to sit down at a train station because our train breaks down in the middle of some godforsaken, I'm not godforsaken, in the middle of some, you know, just Timbuktu, just, you know, random station. We should be able to sit down, chant our japa, go over the hand pump, take a bath, hang up our laundry, whip out the tawa, build a little fire, make some chapatis, lay down, crash out, and like be peaceful. Indian trains teach you satisfaction because they break down on the regular and you just gotta just camp. You got in the middle of nowhere. Just make it happen. It's really far out because like the Indian women just always carry their tawa with them so they can whip up some chapatis. They got a little bag of flour and they just start whipping up chapatis right on the spot. It's just like, you know, it's just it's unbelievable. It's really far out. Roddy kind of does that, right? We travel up in the Himalayas, and she's like, she's got a pot, stove, and she starts whipping up some kitchery. Um, this threefold austerity performed with transcendental faith by men not expecting material benefits, but engaged only for the sake of the Supreme is called austerity and goodness. So those austerities performed with faith for purification. Doesn't mention the scripture, although it does say reciting Vedic scriptures, so the scripture's in there as well. So Krishna's kind of refusing to detach faith from scriptures thus far in this chapter. He refuses. Every time something's really bad, they're not following scripture. They're not having faith. Every time something's really good, they're following scripture, and they're having faith. And so he seems to be refusing the question of Arjuna. If you have faith and you come across the scripture, then you'll follow it. You'll appreciate it. You'll see that it's, it's, it's special, that it's unique, that it's otherworldly, that it's universal. He has something to add to this. We're not done yet, but that's kind of the direction he's going in. And then penance performed out of pride or for the sake of gaining respect, honor, and worship is in the mode of passion. So if you're doing this, but you're trying to get something out of it, you're not doing it for purification. That's the most passion. Again, that's like the opposite. But then the worst version of the opposite, it's neither stable nor permanent. The worst version, kind of formed out of 
penance performed out of foolishness with self-torture or to destroy or injure others is in the mode of ignorance. So it's just like the absolute worst version you could get. It's not just for something like fame and honor, which is ephemeral, but it's actually to hurt other people. Like a voodoo doll, you know? You know, to try to injure people. Or in India, it's very common. You know, you know you'll cast a spell on somebody, or you'll get, you'll get some, somebody to curse somebody or something like that. It's really common in India. We know it's not, you know, we more, more or less we curse people by our negative thoughts about them, and by, you know, by hating on them and speaking ill of them. But in, in, in a lot of old world cultures, you actually break out the voodoo doll and throw a hex on people and throw a curse on people. And so I think we largely, because we're mainly atheists, we don't really do that because we don't believe in that, but we just sort of busy ourselves with hating on the person. Whereas in other cultures, they just actually go, you know what, I hate on this person? Let me just go ahead and throw a, a curse on them. And it's very common when you go to India and you see an astrologer or a palm reader, like, oh, you have, you have a curse on you. You did this or you did that. Somebody's cursed you. And you know, they'll have some way for you to counteract the curse and some mantras you chant or you buy a gem from them or something like that. They have some way to upsell you. It's part of their upsell routine that you've been cursed and they're going to tell you how to mitigate the curse. Um, but I mean, man, my friends have just the wildest stories about being cursed and like how they counteracted the curses and how the people who cursed them then like, like their arm fell off or some crazy stuff. So, you know, I'm just like this much deferential to it. <laughs> I don't really believe in it, but some of the stories my good friends who I believe in have told me are just like ridiculous. Um... I think we'll stop there. Um, thank you very much for joining us. We'll see you guys tomorrow or next week. Thank you, guys. Hare Krishna.